Well, uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for all being here. I'm going to talk about this uh, collaborative project, Extreme Citizen Science, which uh, is a sort of odd thing, which uh, came inadvertently out of my uh, experience of working with hunter-gatherers in Congo. But really, it's a story not about the hunter-gatherers or about us particularly, but about listening to each other and about sharing perspectives and about the importance of being willing to uh, spend the time necessary for that to happen if we really want to start to develop interesting solutions to problems which seem intractable. So, um, oh, okay. so this is a large forest which uh, you will see as uh, probably looking very empty of people. But of course underneath, inside that forest, are large numbers of people. And those people live in uh, small uh, camps dispersed quite uh, widespread across the forest and I spent uh, the past uh, 18 years or so working with them, learning their language, sharing their lives with my wife Ingrid and my son Nando. We lived there for three years in the early 90s and in that process we became aware of a very different way of living and as an anthropologist we use this method called partici participant observation which means that you really learn the language, you spend time really getting into the lives of the people you're living with so that you understand what really matters to them. And I had uh, uh, fairly standard interests at that time which were in ritual, which were in dance and music, things that anthropologists often enjoy getting their teeth into. But at the same time as we were doing all that, we started to uh, learn that there were quite serious uh, other issues going on in this forest. And the, those issues, I'm sorry, the slides have somehow not come in my order. Um, those issues were, were really issues that these young people will face as they're growing up. This is a society which is based on sharing. And sharing results in some very interesting consequences if you apply it rigorously. They have politically egalitarian social forms. They uh, have nobody has more than other people. If I have more than I initially need, I can immediately uh, have that demanded from me by somebody who hasn't got that thing. So in a sense, in these societies, goods are free. You don't have to pay for the things you don't have. You have to ask for them. And, uh, and this sharing ethos is really very dominant in these groups. And they're now, unfortunately, surprisingly rare in the world. Though, of course, we are all uh, evolved as hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gathering represents probably the most stable, enduring, and sustainable lifestyle of any human groups anywhere in the world. But this uh, way of life is being uh, challenged very radically by notions of development and the importance of monetarizing resources that otherwise are uh, sitting quietly in nature. And what happened in the Congo was that these huge forests, um, something like the size of Belgium, uh, was under pressure from international organizations like the World Bank and, and other international creditors. Um, told, uh, the government was told they must develop it, so they start to generate an income to repay these huge debts that they've taken. And so the idea was by creating concessions, you could invite outsiders to bid uh, for the rights to exploit those resources. In these cases, it's mostly trees, though mines and, and minerals are now becoming the really big issue that people want to, to uh, the, the big resources people want to extract from these areas. But as you can see, the whole forest has been carved up and rented out to various international companies without any regard for the local hunter-gatherers. And these outsiders, the first thing they need to do, of course, is get access to these resources. And so suddenly areas which the hunter-gatherers controlled, because you wouldn't be able to go there unless they took you, um, were accessible to anybody who could get into a car. And of course, the resources that uh, people have been mainly uh, extracting up until now are these trees, and in particular, uh, the r African mahogany, which is also called sapeli. Um, it's not clear-cut logging as you get in some parts of the world. This is very selective logging. It's about one and a half trees per hectare. So it doesn't have a big impact on the biomass of the forest, but it has a substantial impact on the biodiversity of the forest. And it also, of course, generates huge income 
And areas of forest like this, in extraordinarily short amounts of time, become areas of forest like this, literally five or six years. Thousands of people are suddenly living in an area of huge biodiversity, and they have needs. They have lots of different uh, uh, food that they need, uh, money and, and uh, social life, and all sorts of other things that people living in groups require. Now, this forest is full of tsetse fly, so cattle don't survive. But um, people, of course, uh, use uh, the protein around them, which is the bushmeat, the wild animals that roam in the forest. And so suddenly, with this huge demand for bushmeat, you have commercial hunters moving out using those roads and accessing lots of different parts of the forest. And the, uh, maybe if it was just consumed locally, it wouldn't be too much of a problem. But of course, these things are exported nationally along the same roads that uh, allow you into the forest, connect up to other road networks, and even internationally, you can buy bushmeat from probably from this forest uh, in London here, as well as in America, in New York, and in <coughs> Paris. And this attracts, of course, the attentions of conservationists. And on the, uh, your left here, you can see about 3,000 wire traps which were collected in just two weeks of patrols around a small area of forest. Um, this really is having a very serious impact on the animals living in this forest. One of the key solutions for the conservationists is to, uh, to train up these paramilitary units called eco-guards who move around the forest looking for poaching and poachers' activities. And uh, one of the problems, though, that they face is that actually the really serious poaching is organized by national elites. And they can't control them without fearing reprisals, risking reprisals, quite serious reprisals. And so because they want to do their job and they are concerned about addressing poaching, they tend to go for softer targets, very often uh, the local hunter-gatherers and local farming people. And the local people, the forest people, feel very persecuted by this, and they feel very resentful that the really big poachers who are causing very serious problems are not being tackled uh, by this process. In about 2005, the logging company who dominated most of the area I did my research in decided to go for a Forest Stewardship Council certificate. Now, this certificate requires uh, a whole set of environmental uh, calculations to be done about what's a sustainable harvest and so on, but also a whole set of social uh, uh, activities to ensure that it's socially durable, that the people who also depend on this same forest are able to continue to uh, live and, and use the forest resources in the way they have previously. Now, the foresters are technicians, so calculating what the sustainable harvest was, how to narrow the roads and so on, was something they were very capable and able to do. But they weren't anthropologists, and they didn't know how to deal with the issues around people. So they asked me to help them. So I went to see my friends and I said, well, what do you think about logging? What, what is, is, is logging good? And they said, well, look, we've got a big forest. It's full of resources. We share things. We don't mind sharing uh, some of our trees with them. But there are some things that annoy us. We don't like it when the bulldozers drive over our tombs, when they spoil the springs that uh, come up in the forest where we get good water. Um, we're not happy when they cut down our medicinal trees or our sacred trees. And, uh, and one thing that we really are unhappy about is when they cut down our caterpillar trees. And these caterpillar trees uh, give abundant amounts of caterpillars just at the time when the animals are dispersing in the forest at the beginning of the rainy season. And, uh, and they grow on the number one commercial species uh, that the loggers like to take out, sapeli trees. And so this posed a problem. And when I reported this back to the logging company, they were very distressed. They thought that they were going to have to withdraw their main commercial species from production if they wanted this green certificate. I assured them that it wasn't every tree. It was just key trees that go be above the canopy that attract the butterflies that lay the eggs that the people want to keep because they're the ones that they regularly go to. So we decided we'd have to map it. And to do that, they had to first identify who um, or who was responsible for which parts of forest. And so we began by noting down which clans were responsible for which areas of forest. With that, they were able to then go and talk to people and ask them to take them around the forest. And using GPSs, they began to mark out and to geotag the different trees that people wanted protected. And this process was very laborious. It took a lot of time. It required large teams of people. And there's huge amounts of human error that enter into these kinds of transcription processes. And it was unsatisfactory. And I wondered, why don't the local people do it? It's a huge area, half the size of Belgium. We need scalable and sustainable solutions. 
And so I imagined maybe using icons uh, to, to uh, allow people to, to collect the data themselves. And we found a UK software company willing to make it into software. And they turned it into this piece of software, which we loaded onto a, a handheld computer with a GPS unit on top. And we started to show it to people. And very quickly, within 15 minutes, actually, most people can learn how to use it quite effectively. The only people who had slight problems were people with uh, uh, eyesight uh, issues, some of the elder people. So what would happen is we'd get combinations with the old people telling the younger people where to uh, note the uh, um, uh, particular resources, and the younger people learning, of course, in the process where those resources were. And so very soon we started to replace the GPS on the right there with these uh, handheld computers and people started to make maps. If, for instance, you were a lady who wanted to protect a sacred tree, you'd start on screen one uh, on the left here and you'd pick at the bottom this icon with people which represents cultural and religious resources. That would take you to screen two where you'd have a choice of uh, uh, another set of icons and this one at the bottom is one of the forest spirits so you would press on the forest spirit, and that would take you to a third screen where you'd have the choice of marking a sacred path, which are always marked with these palm fronds, or a sacred tree. And you press the button, or you press the sacred tree, the machine goes beep, and you know that you've recorded that particular resource. And so very quickly, uh, maps, um, maybe we need to dim the light slightly, uh, maps like this would start to be made by the local hunter-gatherers and, uh, and, and would show the particular areas where they had resources. Um, the loggers could then turn these maps into GI, uh, ArcView, which is the geographic information system <laughs> software that they use for planning and managing all their cutting schedules, and so protect, uh, uh, remove from their cutting schedules any resources that the local people wanted uh, protected. And even in areas of forest as heavily used as this, um, they were actually able to protect and remove from the cutting schedule all the resources that local people wanted protected. And the reason was that they have a 15% margin of flexibility in, in, in planning their cutting schedules. And so the system um, suddenly allowed people like this who prefer to stay in the forest, in their forest camps and their forest places, an ability to speak in places like this, but not by being there, but by sending their maps there. And they love the fact that the maps now go into these intimidating environments, and the loggers love the maps because they can very easily integrate them back into their GIS systems that they use for managing their exploitation. And, and the communication suddenly flows in a very easy way, in a way that it never did before. Once agreed upon, the communities go back and they mark the cemeteries or the trees that they want protected. And now every logging company in the Congo Basin that wants to go for this Forest Stewardship Council label uses this system with uh, uh, varying uh, quality, I must say. Um, and so this now continues on as we speak in, in wherever there are new uh, places they're going to cut. But of course, trees are important for all the forest communities, and particularly for those who are the poorest forest communities, because those are the resources they can collect for free. And uh, in southeast Cameroon, the Baka communities there have a great problem with illegal logging. And what happens here is that uh, artisan cutters will come into the forest, cut down uh, caterpillar trees like this one, and saw it on site and then transport it, it out of the forest. So we developed a new set of software which tried to deal with that. And here we have uh, a, a, a stump. And because the size of the stump depends on legality, you can't cut trees that are too small. So we had sets of string of different lengths which people could use then to give a rough sense of the size of the stump or log that they found in the forest. And we would go around to different communities, showing them the icons, not telling them what they meant. So they told us what the icons meant. And as people stumbled and, and didn't recognize them, we would ad adapt them and change them. And then uh, we would test in another village. But of course, after having gone through what the icons meant, we would take them in the forest. And we'd have a group of women on one side and a group of men. And we'd check that the icons responded to what they wanted to map and, and worked for the things that they felt were important. And there was a huge amount of illegal and uh, wasteful logging going on in their local areas. But very soon, uh, and on return to the village, the software developer would refashion 
the software according to the feedback we'd got from the village. So when we went to the next community, we could test it again. And after three communities, in fact, we managed to stabilise the software and have all the issues that people wanted to address addressed. And this is the one which is to do with the illegal logging, number six, Flag T here. And notice this uh, Caterpillar tracks, the bulldozer tracks, which show it's an industrial logger as opposed to the planks on the bottom here, which show that it's an artisanal logger who's going to be cutting with his uh, chainsaw. And this has implications for the sorts of maps that we make. So here, for instance, you can see that someone's been cutting undersized logs, but we see planks next to caterpillar tracks. So we don't know if it's an industrial logger or a local person. And these are the sorts of issues which the Ministry of Forestry officials go and check. Um, this community, for instance, very wide use of forest, lots of resources that they're exploiting. Um, but when we remove the layers, we can show very clearly which are the resources that need to be checked by government officials. And people aren't making mistakes. They're recognizing um, the uh, difference sizes. This is a community forest, which is normally meant to be managed for the benefit of the community. But the uh, management group in charge of this community forest are clearly not doing that. And they're allowing artisanal loggers to come in and cut all sorts of undersized trees, which will have uh, negative consequences for people's access to resources. Here's uh, a, a couple of communities who have a very wide use of resources, even in this logging concession, which is coloured in pink here. But what we can see is that the logging loggers are also exploiting outside the limits of their logging concession, which is, of course, a serious uh, offence. The Congolese uh, hunter-gatherers were so impressed by the efficiency of the maps to make changes in the way the loggers were working that they asked us to develop some anti-poaching software so that we could start to address the problem caused by poachers. And together with them, we elaborated a set of uh, new icons for that. And uh, just in April, I've just been in Congo testing now what we, we do is we, we can use smartphones because they're sufficiently robust and uh, efficient to, uh, to replace those rather clunky handheld computers we had previously. And uh, to our great pleasure and surprise, they work very well under the forest canopy. The GPS is quick reacting. And uh, the software, while having some changes which we need to make, was largely successful. We're working with some Italians called X-Tribe who develop games. And we're developing geographic uh, games where we try and train people to understand two-dimensional representations of landscape. And so here um, we have some satellite imagery and we're trying to understand what degree of uh, uh, zoom uh, people find most easy to work with so that as we develop mapping applications for the hunter-gatherers, they'll be able to understand them easily. And we're also looking at alternative forms of uh, energy generation. Solar panels don't work well in the forest because of the canopy. So these uh, heat charging uh, uh, pots are very uh, efficient in this particular context. So we're looking for solutions that are appropriate to the particular places where we're working. Now, this is all part of a group, actually, which is made up of people from all over the world. We are from all sorts of disciplines. Uh, we've mentioned anthropology, computer science, but there's also geography. There are artists, foresters, hunter-gatherers. And it's actually the combination of all these different knowledges which is what allows us to come to appropriate solutions. And I think that, actually, this is a really important uh, point which I've learned from the hunter-gatherers, the importance of sharing, of being willing to share knowledge, to share skills, to share perspectives. And it's only through that sharing that I think we're really going to have a chance of coming up with the solutions that we require to address some of the very serious problems that humanity is going to have to confront in the next century. Um, and I think that uh, Excites is just one small way that we're experimenting in different ways of creating those collaborations, which will provide us with the opportunities of finding solutions to those problems. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.